planet of life and almost infinite diversity. Yet one tiny link unites every living creature, plant or animal, that ever existed. The single cell. The human body is made up of 60 trillion cells, each as tiny as a grain of sand. But within every one of them is a genetic library. The functions of life, our instincts and behavioral patterns inscribed in their volumes. In many ways, human cells today resemble those of the first life forms to thrive in Earth's primordial seas. Etched in the cell is the history of life on our planet. Life that evolved in bursts and swells over four billion years. Planet Earth at the beginning, 4.6 billion years ago. Its surface erupted in a sea of molten magma. A billion years later, the planet was in the midst of a slow cooling process. Vapor rose to the sky condensed and fell to earth in a torrential downpour. In the aftermath of the seemingly endless deluge, the primordial ocean was born. The atmosphere after the formation of the ocean was heavy with carbon dioxide, much like the planet Venus today. Earth was sealed off by thick clouds and the lone streaks of sunlight that penetrated the cloud mass tinted the sky orange. Earth was like a giant steam bath with ocean temperatures soaring over 300 degrees Fahrenheit. But in this primordial soup, the building blocks of life were accumulating. Meteorites showered the Earth perhaps bringing amino acids necessary for the formation of life. And then one day, four and a half billion years ago, an asteroid the size of Mars collided head-on with Earth. This giant impact was the greatest event in our planet's early history. The impact was of such phenomenal magnitude that it carved out part of the Earth's mantle and hurled it into outer space. A portion of the torn mantle was drawn back to Earth. The fragments of debris scattered into space were swept up by powerful gravitational forces. They 
formed a new satellite, which would eventually circle the Earth. This was the birth of the moon. The giant impact shook the Earth to its core. On the ocean floor, rows of hydrothermal chimneys surfaced, spouting molten rock and volatile chemicals. Towering sentinel, the moon stood watch over the roiling seas. The distance between Earth and the moon was half what it is today, creating huge ocean swells and enormous tides with its gravitational pull. As the primordial ocean simmered, Chemical reactions created complex new molecules. Some, such as hydrogen cyanide, would have been lethal to humans. Tiny molecules of these toxic compounds combine to form larger ones. Out of this mix, other molecules that would eventually form DNA, the blueprint of a living cell, took shape. This first step toward life would take nearly a billion years to complete. Eons later, no one can explain how the graceful double helix formed, transforming inanimate compounds into living cells. Cells that could grow and reproduce. The catalyst of life remains unknown. This is White Island, a tiny land formation off northern New Zealand's volcanic coast. The geological setting here mimics conditions on Earth in its early years. Like its volatile ancestors, this speck of an island is a steaming cauldron of activity. A noxious mix of hydrogen sulfide and sulfuric acid gas spews from the depths of the crater. In this remote locale, the search has begun for clues to the origins of life. When life first appeared, scientists believed that the Earth was full of places like this one, Barren landscapes showered with hydrogen sulfide and sulfur, forming a crusty surface. This boiling water contains poisonous hydrogen sulfide. Is it possible that life can exist at nearly 200 degrees Fahrenheit? A microscopic view of the samples reveals scores of tiny bar-shaped creatures. They are bacteria and may be the closest modern link to the first life forms on Earth. Billions of years ago, the planet's first organisms thrived in a toxic soup that would destroy plants and animals today. But over time, a new recipe for life would emerge. At the University of California, Santa Cruz, Dr. David Diemer investigates the origins of life, sometimes mixing evolutionary detective work with music. 
piece he is playing is an interpretation of the human DNA sequence. DNA is a nucleic acid carrying the genetic codes of all the proteins necessary for life. Two symmetrical chains within the double helix spiral about each other, rising and falling in harmony like the right and left hands on a piano. The origin of life had to have occurred using the sorts of chemicals that were available on the early Earth. Comets and meteorites and very small dust particles falling back to the Earth could have brought some of these organic compounds back to the Earth's surface. What I do know is that if it did get released, uh, it would, at least these kinds of molecules would float on the surface of the ocean. And as they floated on the surface like a very thin film of oil, just as we have oil slicks today, wave action and tides and winds would bring this to beaches. And you know, you can go down to the beach today and walk along, you'll see kind of a froth, and all that froth is these kinds of lipid-like molecules that are forming those bubbles that we see even today on oceans. And I can imagine that same thing would have been happening four billion years ago, thereby being concentrated on, on these uh, so-called intertidal zones and uh, being acted upon by heat and sunlight. Inside the thin membrane of these bubbles, the elements of life were accumulating. In his laboratory, Dr. Diemer is recreating nature's primordial experiment, forming bubbles by mixing compounds found in ancient meteorites with water. He hopes to find out how cell membranes may have formed. The surface of the bubble is enlarged. In the middle is the membrane, through which surrounding matter is readily absorbed. What I see there is what must have happened on the early Earth in a tide pool environment. Dry down, lipid-like molecules uh, get dry, they capture other molecules, the tide comes in, the rain falls, fills the pool, and just this kind of reaction must have occurred. The birth of life was perhaps a random and inevitable event. Inside the cell membrane, chemical reactions took place. The elements of life combining through trial and error to create what some have called the finest, most impressive piece of molecular architecture, the DNA strand. The first living things on the planet were probably very simple single cells with one important trait distinguishing them from inanimate matter, a permeable membrane to absorb nutrients. Feasting on the ocean's bountiful supply of amino acids, they somehow managed to replicate themselves. Fragile bubbles on a foamy shoreline, Earth's first life forms were modest. Their origins remain to this day one of life's greatest secrets. Christmas Day, 500 miles off the coast of Acapulco, Mexico. On board the Atlantis II, a research vessel operated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, is a team of scientists led by Dr. Richard Lutz, a marine ecologist from Rutgers University. By using the latest in underwater camera technology mounted on Alvin, one of the world's deepest diving submersibles, Dr. Lutz is hoping to photograph the remains of an underwater volcano that erupted here four years ago. Fine. 
Alvin's crew are veterans of deep oceanic dives. And they know that once clear of their mothership, they're on their own. Their destination is a spot on the ocean floor known to have active hydrothermal vents. Okay, Take it up. 25 meters. For the next 90 minutes, they will descend into an inky blackness and the crushing pressures a mile and a half beneath the surface of the ocean. Depth 2417 meters, 82 off the bottom, call you from the bottom. As Alvin nears the bottom, the exterior lights are switched on, illuminating an astounding seascape. The remains of a lava flow stretching across the ocean floor. Smoking volcanic chimneys billowing plumes of superheated water. The gushing liquid is rich in hydrogen sulfide so concentrated that it would be a toxic waste site on land. The sea floor is alive with creatures living near the vents. Crabs, bathysaurus fish, tube worms, in all, more than 300 new species have been sampled and identified. The scientists retrieve a foam board they had placed there a week earlier. To their surprise, it is completely covered with bacteria. Deceptively lifeless, the deep sea is actually teeming with bacteria, one of the planet's earliest life forms. The breeding ability of these modern organisms far exceeds the expectations of the Alvin scientists. Their success perhaps linked to a diet once shared by their ancestors, hydrogen sulfide from the Earth's core. Bacteria that fed on hydrogen sulfide 3.8 billion years ago are considered the first complex organisms in the evolutionary chain. Earlier life forms simply reproduced themselves using organic matter absorbed from their surroundings. By extracting additional energy from the nutrients in the sea vents, these bacteria thrived. Over time, some developed hard shells. Others, soft membranes. Ironically, all life forms, including humans, can trace our ancestries to the most primitive of organisms spawned in a sea of toxins. Oxygen was a poisonous gas to early life on the planet. Three billion years ago, the Earth was enshrouded in thick clouds, heavy with carbon dioxide and water vapor. Together, the mineral-rich water and CO2 formed new compounds, releasing oxygen into the atmosphere. While bacteria thrived in the Earth's new oceans, Land, by contrast, remained a stark and desolate place. Continents had begun to take shape, but were still uninhabited. Then, half a billion years ago, rumbling with new energy, 
planet Earth remodeled itself. Separated continents began to collide. At points of impact, the steady upthrust of Earth eventually formed huge mountain ranges like today's Himalaya. The towering peaks diverted the jet streams, creating clouds and rainstorms. Torrential downpours sliced into mountainsides, forming valleys. Out of the deluge, rushing channels of water eventually converged into rivers of immense proportion. In the beginning, as wind and rain eroded the surface of the earth, Minerals from land flowed into the ocean, new ingredients to season the primordial soup. The minerals reacted with carbon dioxide, forming new compounds and releasing oxygen. But it would take another two and a half billion years for oxygen to saturate the atmosphere, making it habitable for today's life forms. As this greenhouse effect weakened, the planet began to cool. The thick clouds to dissipate, and rays of sunlight penetrated the seas. These environmental changes would soon play a significant role in stimulating new life. This is Pilbara, a forgotten stretch of desert in northwestern Australia. This region was at the bottom of a shallow sea three and a half billion years ago. The Aborigines of Pilbara have many legends that tell of this place, where they believe land was first created. And it is here that scientists are piecing together a creation story of their own in their search for the first evidence of life. In this dusty outback, Dr. Mike Freeman of the Western Australia Geological Survey Bureau shares an important discovery made in 1992. This contains the, the microfossils, which are the order of 3,460 million years old. Very, very old. In fact, this is one of the oldest rocks in existence today. Within lie traces of life from an ancient sea, an organism barely one one hundredth of a millimeter long. The surrounding rocks show evidence of stromatolites, the fossilized remains of cyanobacteria, microscopic creatures resembling a chain of beads. Cyanobacteria are asexual organisms that reproduce without swapping genetic information with a mate, so they evolve little over time. Modern species look virtually the same as they did billions of years ago. Cyanobacteria get their name from their blue-green pigmentation, the color cyan. We know it as blue-green algae. The first plant life on Earth would be the descendants of this primitive organism. Unlike early life forms, these cells exploited their surroundings to create their own food. Within their cell walls, cyanobacteria used energy, 
combining water and carbon dioxide molecules abundant in seawater to create glucose. Like antennae, these chlorophyll molecules in the cell caught the sunlight, transforming it into energy. A byproduct of this process, oxygen, would one day spark the evolution of more complex life forms. This revolutionary process is, in fact, photosynthesis, used by all plants today. Two and a half billion years ago, seas separated lifeless continents. In Western Australia, those seas are now land formations. On the exposed mountainsides, a mysterious black layer of earth stretches as far as the eye can see. In 1992, a team of researchers headed by Professor Tomohiko Taira with the Tokyo University Institute of Oceanography launched a study to find out what it was. It's totally black. The blackness rubs off on your hands. This mass contains a lot of organic carbon. It's almost like charcoal. In fact, it's an ancient mass of organic carbon, the oldest source of oil on Earth. After several years of research, Professor Taira and his team concluded that this thick black layer of carbonaceous rock, or chert, was a massive accumulation of cyanobacteria fossils deposited here three billion years ago. Microisotopic studies reveal the presence of organic matter, proving the presence of ancient life here. These fossilized remains, 130 feet deep, are evidence of cyanobacteria's once dominant role early in the planet's history. Under different circumstances, these organic deposits might have become oil or coal. The surface that I'm standing on now, the exposed stratum here, is actually the layer of ancient sea bottom. And the same layer of sea floor is connected from here all the way out to the horizon, extending over this entire area. In other words, I think that back then, cyanobacteria had multiplied and spread over the whole sea. The sea wasn't lifeless, rather it was teeming with life, and that's what we've just witnessed. The colony of blue-green algae that blanketed these ancient seas near present-day Australia was the Earth's first documented population explosion. Its success would eventually transform the face of the planet. The Hamlin Pool near Shark Bay in Western Australia. This ecosystem bears the fruit of nearly three and a half billion years of evolutionary change. But cyanobacteria from ages past still blanket the rocks below the waterline. Floating in the open sea, they contain cavities of gas, buoyancy devices, allowing them to rise and fall with changing light intensity. As photosynthesis occurs, they excrete bubbles of oxygen. Soon, the ancient waters brim with oxygen, but most of it would not yet make it into the atmosphere. Iron compounds, ferrous salts from the sea, combine with the oxygen to form ferric oxide, painting the ocean floor a thick, rusty red.
Oxidized iron from the sea also colors the landscape of Pilbara. Almost everywhere else on the planet where cyanobacteria thrived, major iron deposits were formed. Billions of years ago, colonies of cyanobacteria swept across the oceans of the world. In time, all of the iron in the sea was oxidized. But cyanobacteria continued to release oxygen at astounding rates. Great environmental changes were on the horizon as oxygen gained a foothold in the atmosphere and the once volatile orange skies faded softly into blue. As the chemistry of Earth's atmosphere shifted, what happened to the single-cell bacteria that had lived on hydrogen sulfide? Their evolution is linked to the rise of more complex life forms. The sea, once awash in hydrogen sulfide, was now rich in oxygen, thanks to the highly adaptive cyanobacteria. But oxygen was a life-threatening poison to bacteria like these that had survived so long on hydrogen sulfide. The rising spherical bubble is full of oxygen. Once exposed to the gas, the bacteria weaken and eventually die. How did the ancient life forms overcome the oxygen crisis? Soft membrane bacteria adopted a run-for-your-life defense strategy, staying clear of the gas as much as possible. The bacteria with hard shells found ways to exploit their new situation. Plunging into the oxygen-rich environment, they were evolutionary pioneers. Delta del Ebro, Spain, lies due west of Barcelona on the Mediterranean Sea. Locals call it the bull's horns because of its shape. Sewage water from the river flows into this region, making it an ideal breeding ground for bacteria. Microorganisms from ancient times still thrive here. Blue-green cyanobacteria blanket the surface of this slimy landscape. Here on the delta, scientists dig for clues about how early microorganisms adjusted to the oxygen infusion in their environment. This is from a brick. See that? But it's completely colonized <laughs> by these bacteria. They just will grow on anything. They'll grow on volcanic rocks, whatever you give them. Biologist Dr. Lynn Margulis of the University of Massachusetts in Amherst says that bacteria are remarkably adaptive, unlike many creatures that came after them. You have to think of them as not being single. You have to think of them as being many, many kinds. And some of them will just die because we let the oxygen come in contact. But many of them, most of them, will just wait until the oxygen goes away. There's others that will use the oxygen, but low concentration. There's others that lose, use it at somewhat higher concentration. So they line up as to what they can handle. The samples that Dr. Margulis collects from the Delta appear to be mud, but they're actually living colonies of bacteria. This wedge of green mat is cyanobacteria. Below it, a thick colony of bacteria that feeds on hydrogen sulfide. Only an inch from the surface, ancient bacteria survive today. When animals go extinct, they're gone, they're finished. 
But when bacteria change, they keep the old ones and add the new ones. So there's no real loss at all. So these anaerobes are still the way they have been many years. A closer look at the delta sample reveals something new. A thin pink layer separates the oxygen-producing tier of cyanobacteria above from the bacteria subsisting on hydrogen sulfide below. Observing this pink layer, Dr. Margulis discovered some bacteria that behave in a curious manner. This cylinder is a cyanobacterium exhaling oxygen. But instead of dying on exposure to the gas, the small surrounding bacteria advance toward it. Dr. Margulis believes that a similar phenomenon occurred in the ancient seas, as oxygen waste became a key part of the life cycle. For a time, all life in the sea, including the cyanobacteria that produced it, was threatened by the infusion of oxygen. To survive and eventually evolve, the hard-shelled bacteria first developed enzymes to neutralize the damage caused when oxygen reacts with organic molecules. Soon, these survivor cells learned how to harness oxygen as an energy source dramatically increasing their activity level and becoming fierce aggressors. To survive, the soft membrane bacteria from the habitat rich in hydrogen sulfide united with other bacteria, enlarging their body in self-defense. They pooled their DNA in the core of this microorganism and encased it in a new membrane. In this way, the cell nucleus was born. Now, as oxygen further penetrated the air and sea, two distinct organisms with specialized functions were developing. One became a living power plant. The other had an enormous data bank in its cell nucleus. Together, these simple life forms would transform the face of the Earth. Billions of years of evolutionary progress have led to a rich diversity of life across the globe today. All animals, including humans, share the same basic cell structure as the planet's first microorganisms. At the cell's core is the nucleus, an enormous data bank full of genetic information. Moving around the nucleus are small organs, mitochondria, in various shapes and sizes. Their job is to supply the cell with all the energy it needs and to help it breathe. The birth of this cell is one of life's first great adaptations, the merging of the ancient hard and soft-shelled bacteria. How could these once competitive organisms coexist as one life form? The University of Tennessee in Knoxville, where Dr. Quang Jian, a specialist in cell biology, inadvertently witnessed the beginnings of a cellular partnership while running an experiment. In 1969, Dr. Jian was studying the ecology of amoebas he had collected from various lakes around the country. One day, he discovered that most of the amoebas he was cultivating were dying infected by highly toxic bacteria. Removing the dead amoebas one by one, he was surprised by what he found. One amoeba, infected like the others, had somehow managed to survive. 
Examining the single-celled animal, he was stunned to find live bacteria inside. Dr. Gian decided to try another experiment on the same amoeba, five years later. When he extracted the foreign bacteria from inside the amoeba, a strange thing happened. As soon as the bacteria were removed, the amoeba lost its energy. Initially threatened by the bacteria, a symbiosis had developed between the two. Separated from this cooperative relationship, they both died. The bacteria's dependence on amoeba. From the very beginning, we tried to culture these bacteria outside amoeba, but we have not been able to culture them. They grow only within amoeba and so they are getting something from amoeba for their survival and we are trying to uh, find that out now in the meantime we have uh, learned that uh, amoeba produce a, a few proteins that are used by bacteria and so it's it's a kind of exchange the phenomenon dr Jian witnessed in his laboratory may have imitated evolutionary patterns in the early seas. Two billion years ago, two very different microbodies merged to create an entirely new organism. Its success would ultimately lead to the proliferation of new species across the globe. The cell is the foundation of all life. Without it, no living creature could eat or breathe or grow. Our very existence depends on it. Every animal cell requires the nucleus to transmit information from its genetic data bank to the mitochondria. And the mitochondria, in turn, to fuel the cell with energy. When these microbodies work together, a cell has the energy to respond to environmental pressures. Throughout history, creatures that cooperate ensure their future while building increasingly complex ecosystems. It took some two and a half billion years for life to evolve beyond primitive microorganisms. But when change came to the planet's oceans, it was dramatic. New creatures of every shape and design tried their luck in the game of survival. But for millions of years, longer than the entire history of man, only one of them ruled the deep. The success of this aggressive carnivore may have triggered the planet's first population explosion. The sea, a vast staging area for evolution. 10,000 new species each more curious looking than the next, developed during this period. The better the design, the greater the chance of survival. Yet few of these creatures, including the once fearsome predator, would rise through the ages. Two billion years ago, only one tenacious life form thrived in our ancient seas. Today, life flourishes in every biosphere across the planet. We owe this abundance 
the millions of plants and animals that grace the land, the sea, and the skies of planet Earth to life's smallest unit, the single cell.